the wormhole where we discuss everything from ancient civilization to modern day social issues and everything in between. I'm Les. And I'm Stevie J. And today we're going to be talking about International Men's Day, which doesn't get talked about all that often, I, uh, I would say. But we have a very special guest to talk about one of the major issues that men face, which is the abuse of men by women. So we're joined by licensed counsellor, therapist and author, Anne Silvers. Welcome, Anne. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, it's just such a pleasure to have you on. And uh, we have caught up before you and I have. Um, but I think, you know, with International Men's Day coming around, which for people uh, watching or listening is the 19th of November, I think um, it is at least one opportunity for men to have a day of being able to speak up about some of the issues that they face. And not just men, everybody talking about the issues that men face and also some of the positive things that men bring to society as well, because... Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what gets forgotten too, is that, you know, men contribute in a positive way to a lot of society. So what, I guess initially from me anyway, what are your thoughts on International Men's Day? It's great for all the reasons that you just said, um, that A, to bring awareness to the ways that men and boys are hurting, which mm -hmm. we have an empathy gap when it comes to males. And it's really important, you know, like we need a day to help bring awareness to we have to care about men and boys. And um, and then the other side is to bring awareness to some recognition of we depend on guys for a lot of things and we should be showing some appreciation for that. Um, we some of the ways that we defend, depend on guys, we need to mellow out on, but we have to even recognize those in order to, to be less stringent. Like the idea that men are supposed to fix everything. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, we should appreciate guys being around to do that at the same time as we don't confine them to that box and expect right. them to actually fix everything. And yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of uh, downsides to those sorts of, societal um gender role conforming concept yeah and and men uh, women blew out of that box a long time ago so for <laughs> females in the you know 1950s 1960s 70s we had people like betty friedman and gloria steinem saying no you know the box is bad we don't want to uh, girls don't have to wear dresses girls get to climb trees girls can be doctors mm -hmm. girls can like science all these different things and we haven't had a movement like that for males so no. the, the box is is confining um, yeah it is i guess that you know you bring up a good point there about how we haven't had that sort of coming out of the box or the exploding of that box for men why do you think that is mm -hmm. well interesting question so um hmm probably some of the reasons why the gender role, the gender roles are there in the first place. So mm -hmm. let's look at some of the things. Um, don't talk, especially mm -hmm. don't talk about painful stuff, emo emotionally painful stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't really have emotions, don't express them. Um, and be able to fix everything. Don't ask for help. You know, a lot of don'ts in, in this. Yeah. which keeps men in their place. Like, so if society wants to quiet men, then there's this perpetuation. If, mm -hmm. if society wants men to go off to war and be okay with that, numb them out. Don't, mm -hmm. don't give them a, a room to express fear. Um, and so they will, you know, march before the bullet. And I think that that's some ancient roots for, the man law and mm -hmm. we have to take a look at what's the downside to all this stuff because for me there's a lot of downside we have 75 percent of the suicides are males we have 75 percent. this this is us that's us and pretty much the english-speaking world mm -hmm. um, i know about the numbers for like uh drug abuse deaths and uh, in, in Washington state, I think they're true for the US and I'm guessing they're true for again, the Eng at least the English speaking world. Um, and that's like same, same number, 75% of the opioid deaths, the drug abuse deaths are male. 
Mm -hmm. and, and people are coming up with a term, which I think is fantastic, which is deaths of despair. That is an interesting term. That yeah. is. Yeah. So it includes the suicides and the, the substance abuse deaths. Oh. And, wow. and to me, those 75%, I mean, that's huge. And, yeah. and so looking at that is I go back to the man law. I go back to don't talk. Yeah. Don't express your feelings. Pretend mm -hmm. you don't have any kind of pain, emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And the don't express your feelings involves a numbing out that not only numbs out the pain, it numbs down the joy. As right. Well. Right. Good point. Yeah. I, I yeah, like it numbs that. out everything. Yeah. And so guys are expected to not be, you know, women probably have a little bit more room to express the joy than than guys do. And from my perspective, emotions are all information. They are meant to keep us safe. They're meant to make our life better and better. We have to be able to take in that information and analyze it and use it. On the feel good side of things, savoring the feel good gives us chips in the bank for stress resilience. And on the painful side of things, identifying and processing the pain creates all kinds of checks and balances for us that helps us create a roadmap for our world, for our life. Mm -hmm. uh, they're so crucial to human health, happiness, and prosperity that pushing males to not identify their emotions, not express them, is very harmful. And it's taught from an early age. Yeah. Very early age. Like I, I will be a hundred percent honest. It took me into my late thirties to actually meet a man who was willing to show some emotion. Mm -hmm. Like all of my relationships were just, it was, it was very, well, obviously I, I had a pattern and I had something I was used to <laughs> from childhood. I, mm -hmm. I had something that I was, I was bringing in, but just the fact that like, it was, it was hard to understand that men had emotions because they didn't express it. Like I, I, you know, we're not mind readers. So mm -hmm. how are we to know how they're feeling? And if they're not quote unquote allowed to say anything, well, therein lies the problem. Right. Like, mm -hmm. What, 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 what makes it so, I don't know, um, less manly to say, Hey, like, this is what's going on within me. I am, I'm sad. I'm upset. I'm, you know, whatever it may be. And like, even in my relationships, they would, they would, you know, the relationship would end. And it seemed like I was just a fixed, like I was just a thing. Like I wasn't a person. Like it, it, it always seemed like, well, they're not upset that I'm, I'm not here anymore. Mm -hmm. Like they, they can't even go to that extent to say, I, you know, I'm upset unless they weren't upset that that's fine. <laughs> but like that, that, but mm -hmm. I see that a lot, like just watching. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge people watcher and just watching this is the pattern as well. So it's almost like that, that one thing of, of them being very stoic and, and having the rest of the world believe that they're not affected by anything. Mm -hmm. It sets them up to be the target of things because we're like, well, they're not affected by it. Look at them. Look, not affected. I can do whatever mm -hmm. I want. And it's not. So it is a hundred percent not. So, and it, I'm very, confused of how we could do this to people I'm very confused of how we could manipulate an entire gender into thinking that they had to be had to be a certain way yeah uh, well, and i'm glad that you used the word stoic because it, it uh i have a, a male client who definitely was getting into problems in his life in his marriage because he was numbed out Mm. And it was creating um, drive to things that then, then they're looking for a heightened emotional experience, right? Because normal mm. is numbed out. So you create a draw to the heightened. I think this, again, could play into the drug use. Is mm -hmm. you're drawn back to that thing that's going to push past your numbing out mechanism. Yeah, and um, so he had had as a goal to be stoic, and he was reading a book about the bounties of stoicism. Like this is what the what, this is what is manly. This is what a guy should 
uh, be working towards is, is being more and more stoic. And what we, what we realized together was that this was a key part to what was making him unhealthy. And, uh. and, and it got very much between him and his wife. And so this has come up a number of times in couples counseling, because I'm also a couples mm. counselor. So, right. you know, you often hear the woman saying, he doesn't talk to me. He doesn't tell me what he's thinking and feeling. And the guy is, guy is like thinking, but I am, or, you know, that's all I yeah. can think of. Because yeah. again, male training has this so confining. Yeah. Yeah. And another, I, I, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry to cut you off there, Anne, but that, I found that really interesting what you just said there because, you know, <clears throat> as a guy growing up, I feel like the communication tools. So I think I think a big part from my point of view is having the communication tools to be able to share those emotions, <clears throat> and you you don't learn that. So because you're told, "Oh, get over it. It's not a big deal. Don't be you know don't be a baby kind of thing." man up you don't ever get sat down and given the tools to communicate what it is you're actually feeling in any kind of meaningful Mm -hmm. way yeah and just on one of the other points that you raised there about the stoicism and this man saying right you know writing and saying well you got to go out and find that next level thing to make you be able to feel something Mm -hmm. well i feel like when i because i was much sort of the opposite of les's experience when i it came to my late 30s i didn't find uh, a partner I could, a person I could actually, you know, a woman open up to and speak to and share emotions with where I wasn't going to get ridicule. I wasn't going to get judgment. I wasn't going to get all of those things. And I found that very exhilarating. So, you know, where, you know, this guy's writing the book about the stoicism and then you've got to go and try and find that other thing to, to give you that fulfillment. Well, th- for me, that exhilaration came from being able to share and being able to, you know, share comfortably and not be ridiculed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it's a very um, interesting to me to hear, you know, you talking about this stuff as well and the, and the man law and this gentleman who's writing a book about stoicism. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. Now, yeah, and the guy who's writing about stoicism, he's he that's his his idea is to be a better and better man, you become more and more stoic. Uh, the idea that the stoicism has this cost of driving you towards something to give you the heightened emotional experience like drugs or sex or you mm-hmm. know, video games or you know something that's going to give you heightened feelings. Um, that's my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many people agree with me. But... Oh, it- but you know, um, I come from an abusive marriage, mm. and I so I numbed out. So all of that, I like, yeah, it took me so long to feel anything, absolutely anything, and I can completely understand how you know men they they go they go get a Harley, they they mm. go get a real you know the fastest Corvette they can find. <laughs> right. I I I get it. Yeah. I get it. Because you're, it you need that adrenaline rush. You need that hit, because it's pushing past the thing. So I can I can understand the drugs. I can understand the drinking. I understand all of it. And if we just paid a little bit more attention to the men in our lives and like their behavior that they're doing, mm-hmm. we could intervene so fast. We really could. We could say, okay, like re- like what's going on, like. And give them a safe place because men are ridiculed. They are ridiculed like nobody's business just for having an emotion that is, I don't know, inconvenient for the people in front of him. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. And you bring up a really good point. Um, There's in the last decade or so, there's more and more people talking about male depression looks different than female depression. Yeah. Yeah. And way back when the psychology field developed the diagnostic manual, they looked at females and how females, um, how depression shows up in females. And they used that criteria, this bullet points criteria yeah, okay. of this is what has to be there in order to diagnose depression. Well, now they realize that 
yeah, it could look like that in guys, but it could also look like these other ways in guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is got to do with guys taking maneuvers that get around this heavy weight of emotion they're feeling. So a woman might go to bed and stay in bed, right? That's that Mm -hmm. could be her Mm -hmm. way of dealing with the heavy weight of the emotions. (laughs) A A guy could go out and look for more, more numbing. So more sort of more active numbing. The drugs, gotcha. the alcohol, the video games, the the sex, mm-hmm. these things. Yeah. That, so affairs could actually be, I mean, it could be just a, a guy making bad choices. Be, it could be a guy being a bad guy. It could yeah. be right. depression. It could be acting out depression. Mm-hmm. So we have to have more curiosity Yeah, uh, when we see those those movements towards um, those those numbing out behavior and try and look at what's going on behind. And I think, again, this is where the empathy gap comes into play, where Mm -hmm. if a female is showing up with things like that, we're much more likely to ask the question, why? And if a guy shows up with things like that, we're much more likely to say, well, you need to change. You need to not do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think that's (laughs) Sorry, Sorry you, but do you think it's because it makes because we're not used to it? Like, I don't want to say it makes me uncomfortable when a man shares his feelings with me, mm-hmm. but at first it was because I didn't I didn't know if it was a trap. I didn't know I didn't know what was going on. Like, what the mm-hmm. hell is this? So, do you think it's because we say, "Oh, well, you need to change because this behavior that you're presenting is really uncomfortable for me because I've never experienced this before." So, you, sir, need to go away. Fix fix whatever this is, you know, without involvement of anyone else, because you're just making everyone else uncomfortable. Well, I, yeah, like, you can see how people can get all bunched up. You're right. And that's a good point. And But the thing is, when women share their emotions, because of the way that we're all programmed, when women share their emotions, people don't do that. They may feel like saying, go and sort that out over there. But people don't do that. They say, oh, what, what, what help can we offer? And then, like Anne, you mentioned in your book as well, the the type of um, you know is one of the types of manipulation. And there it is, the book. It's a, it's a great book. Everybody, please go and purchase this book. It's fantastic for everybody. And uh, we will have the link in the description of this as well. Yep. Um, but you know, all of that help gets offered to women. But one of the things you mentioned in the book is that. Uh, there's the guy who wants to kind of be the fix it person. And mm. then a woman could recognize that and and use that as part of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, an abuse strategy to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm depressed or I'm this or I'm that. You need to come and save me. You need mm. to come and help me and make it all yeah. about me. And therefore, all of the feelings and emotions that he might have are now invalid and don't get any airtime. There's, there's no there's no space to talk about that. Yeah. And, and guys are, you know, that's the rescue the damsel in distress. It's one of the, yeah. one of the roles that we give to guys and, and, you know, it's trained in, it's in cartoons. It's in, it's in yeah. you know, Disney movies. It's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. And, yeah. Uh, and then we have certain guys that are you know, much more likely. I, when I was going through my divorce, my divorce attorney told me that, she actually had a lot of firefighters who were her clients and she found who were, who were going through divorces and she found they were rescuers. Well, look at that. That's a whole mm. category of people who are drawn to a profession. Yeah. Where yeah. They are rescuers. And it turns out that quite often in their relationships, they are, they're drawn to um, people that they, they see as they can be the helper for, they can raise up. Now you did mention in your book about how, and it, it was it was towards um, how you know women in you know high high energy um, positions at work, whether it be the CFO, the CEO, whatever the hell they may be, um, how they will sometimes take their work their work per- persona mm-hmm. and bring it home, and and still dictate and you know you, like her husband is her little employee, so it's just funny how women will like we'll both do that we'll take our our profession and we'll we'll tie it into our relationships 
So that's really yeah. interesting because yeah, I, I just I was like because I never put two and two together that yeah. you know like someone in a in a high power position will come home and still think that they are in that high power position in the home that you're supposed to be equals. Right, right. And it you could know. be the man or the woman who's, who's exactly exactly. And I do find yeah. too that people carry potentially their communication style from work into yes. home. So yeah. police officers tend to be interrogators. Yeah. Uh, EMT people tend to be everything's an emergency. You gotta find out right now. <laughs> decision. I'm writing it on a little card as well. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's sad, right? <laughs> <laughs> Their license plate even says it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so besides writing the book about um, abuse, which is the you know the the what goes wrong in in relationships, mm -hmm. I also have books about uh, how to how to make relationships right. You know, so communication. We talked a lot mm -hmm. about emotions and. Yeah. So I've got books about emotions and uh, emotion skills and a way of describing it that makes it very concrete so mm -hmm. that we can take these intangible concepts like emotions and and listening and, and things like that and, and mm -hmm. take them to a concrete place where we break it down, make it easy to digest. That's my goal in every everything I write is break it down, yeah. make it easy to digest. Well, you do a fantastic job. I mean, I could, I I could understand everything, and it made total sense to me. And I'm just, you know, I'm a lay person. I've not had any experience or reading or you know any training in counselling or anything like that. So when I was reading it, I, it made full sense to me, which is a credit to you because I guess you know as an author, you did a great job in translating the language that you understand things into language I understand or people like me. So yeah. it's, a, it's a fantastic book. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, just had, I, really I had somebody reach out to me and say, I'd like to review your book. I do a lot of peer review in journals for books. I'd like to do that. I said, okay, fine. You know, it's a, sure. Yeah. And then he responded with this like pages of tearing the book apart <laughs> because oh. from his perspective, it wasn't academic enough. Oh, but it's not for academics. Exactly. It's not for academics. It's for it's for everybody. And and yeah. I'm I have written recently a chapter for an academic project. Um and that one I I had to totally change my writing style and go right. go to the academic style. And it was a great exercise because it made me back more aware of current research and, and all of that. But um when, when I was first asked to write the chapter and I knew it was an academic project, I said to the professors who reached out to me, now you've read my writing, right? You know that I don't write in that style. And they're like, yeah, but you're the, you're the one. <laughs> and it's a chapter about helping abused men. Oh, nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's really good. Well, I was are going you... to actually, oh, sorry, you go. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, are you feeling that quite possibly we're starting, like the tide is starting to shift when it comes to, because I was thinking this morning, um, just like the backlash that we get as women when we stand up for men and their rights when it comes to being abused, like the backlash that we get from other women is is horrific. It's like they call us women haters and all that. It's like, well, that's what you think. That's fine. Um, like, do you find that that's getting toned down a little bit and and it's starting to to shift i hope so because enough is enough yeah it's definitely the johnny depp trial i was changed, gonna say changed everything it, it yeah. changed everything thank thank Good. you thank you johnny for standing up and and going through all that pain to have a voice yeah. and um because i've been at this for quite a few years and and i was active on social media watching the shift happen in in real time so mm -hmm. at the the pre-trial there's just a small group of us on twitter who are talking you know obviously back and forth about the case and and in general about abused men mm -hmm. and false accusations against men and yeah. um and then even at the beginning of the trial there was very little shift initially 
until we got into a few days of Johnny being on the stand and people started to notice and and get the story. And I think it's that mm -hmm. personal exposure to yeah. men's stories that helps get past the myths. Mm -hmm. The myths are twofold. The myths are that uh, abuse in relationship only happens female, male to female. And then the second part, if it happens to happen that a woman hits a guy, it's really not that bad and it's really not that often. Mm -hmm. Both elements there are just myths. They're, they're not reality. In, in reality, there's great research and statistics that show that it's about equal, about mm -hmm. equal numbers of men are abusing women in relationships and women are abusing men, and it's equally bad. Yes. Uh, right. We have equal numbers uh, that are getting harmed, physically harmed to the degree where it's, uh, you know, requires hospitals or, or various other markers mm -hmm. of it's, it's bad. Right. Yeah. But I feel when you said that as well, I feel so the numbers are equal, the occurrences are equal, the <clears throat> the consequences are, and when I say consequences, I mean for the victim are mm -hmm. essentially, um, you know, relatively equal. But one or two things that aren't equal is the resources available for support for, mm -hmm. for men and women is vastly different. There's yeah. a big gap there. Um, and as you already sort of talked about, the the societal attitudes towards uh, both victims are very, very different as well. Yeah, yeah. And part of that has got to do with uh, the history of the of the raising awareness about domestic violence, the topic of domestic violence. Historically, it has women got organized first. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things about women versus men and the and the cultural training. Women are better at organizing themselves around social issues. Mm -hmm. Men, okay, they can organize a company, it seems. <laughs> they've been they've been put in that realm, <laughs> right? But but I've often said organizing men is like herding cats. Like that's just yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's so frustrating because if they're not supposed to talk and they're not supposed to have emotions, mm -hmm. they're not supposed to need help. Well, why in the world would they put themselves in a position of going to other men and organizing in this way mm -hmm. around right. the issue? So, Unless you're anonymous, that yes, they can that they can organize, right? But that's the thing. Like it's it's but see anonymous behind a mask, right? Mm -hmm. It's right. behind a it's it's almost like. I, I nearly said another uh, group that puts things on their heads to hide their faces, but I won't. Um, but it seems like whenever they do do these things, it's hidden in in some way, shape, or fashion mm -hmm. to not be exposed. Yeah. Is it the fear of being a, to be vulnerable, like the, the, for us to see that that soft underbelly that they actually care about something? Because I need like anonymous comes forward. We're like, no, 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 we care about this one thing. Well, that's them showing their empathy. Well, because they're admitting that they care about something, put on a mask and you're safe to do so. Well, I, that's a great point that you just brought up. Sorry. And I just, uh, and I'd love to get your thoughts, but I just really want to quickly say that's a really, really great thing to, to bring up because men, it's one thing for a man to show emotion and to show um, some kind of caring about a woman. For example, mm. to to say I will show emotion because I care about a woman, but it's a very very different thing for a man to say I'm going to show emotion because I care about another man, not yeah. someone I'm in a relationship with or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just another man in general, because even even sh you know sharing that caring nature with another man and and those sort of feelings of hey I care about you, it doesn't. It's not anything else to it. It's just I care about you can be rejected from that other man as well because of the the, the, the training that you talked about, you know, and that that way of thinking that everybody has. So men are more likely to show that kind of emotion towards women, but far less towards other men. Yeah. Yeah. You make a great point. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, there's a book that shifted kind of shifted everything for me. And mm -hmm. it's it's by Terrence Real. And it's called, I don't want to talk about it. And the oh, subtitle is something about men in depression. 
And um, I read this book as my my project in in when I was working on my bachelor's of psych uh, psychology. And I actually did a minor in women's studies. And the last women's studies class I took was a class on men and didn't really care for a lot of what the guy had to say. It was a lot about the men's movement that was about going out into the forest and beating on drums. And it just didn't, you know, I just didn't see a lot of value there. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to laugh. I'm like, that's the best they could come up with. <laughs> I feel like I'm not a man now. I've got no drums here. I've got guitar. No drums. You got the guitar. Come on. You got the guitar. That's I know nothing bad about musical instruments. But, <laughs> but so I read this book and and Terrence Real did a great job of talking about this again, this cultural, these gender roles that we confine males to. And and that is still ongoing, this confinement and the the idea of uh, don't talk, don't have emotions, certainly don't express them, don't need to, don't ask for help, fix everything. These kinds of what I call man law, um, mm -hmm. he's talking about how they contribute to depression. And and he's, Terrence Real is the one where I first was exposed to this idea of male depression looks different than female depression. So it's, a, it's still a great book. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't remember why I started talking about this. Are you because you were talking about men and uh, men caring about other men and like sharing those yeah. right. sharing that emotion. But, yeah. Well. So Terrence talks about he'd never known a guy who didn't, you know, put his toe in the water to talk about his emotional state just to another guy and get slammed. Right. Yeah. Yep. Like yeah. what and and look from my personal experience, you know, it could be it could look like and what are you telling me all this for? Like, what? Why are you talking to me about this? Why are you asking me about this? Why? Why are we having this conversation? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. what do I look like? Your wife? Like, that oh. that, <clears throat> that okay. kind of comment. I mean, and look, that was you know that's a general experience I've had, but naturally, you know, I've been drawn to more similar people to me, and and so the the friends, the mates I've got now are much more open to those sorts of things. So. Um, the people I've kept around me, those those guys, we we do talk more about our emotions. It's not like we sit down specifically to talk about it, but we're open to it coming up in conversation and and actually, you know, genuinely caring about how we feel instead of just getting our drums and heading to the forest. So right. yeah. <laughs> and and for for me as a woman to to see him with so many, you know, great men around him and mm. they are comfortable talking about the emotions if it happens to come up it was a huge eye opener for me huge mm. eye opener because i've never seen another man have such um unless you were on dr phil i've never seen that happen out in the wild so to speak <laughs> it was really refreshing like i've never seen it and mm. i think you know i think it's really healthy and I, and i think it's fantastic because we can't have you know, if we're relying on men to fix things for us, we should probably make sure that they're mentally, physically, and spiritually okay to mm. be able to take care of, you know, the things that we quote unquote expect of them. We should stop expecting anything. But anywho, like, yeah, and we women should be uh, stepping up to the plate and expect ourselves to fix a bunch of things that uh, exactly that we're laying on guys to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, on that point, and, and you know, it is International Men's Day coming up on the 19th. So I, I wanted to ask you this question. You've got some great advice towards the end of your book as well. Um, and for yes. both um, male victims of domestic violence, you've got um, some helpful points in there for women in recognizing maybe if they're, you know, being an abuser or having some abusive, um, you know, behaviors in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So all of that advice is fantastic. But with specifically with, I guess, um, these men's issues and International Men's Day, what do you think will really help get the word out there? So we've got this one day, but what sort of things would be great to have a, as a part of that International Men's Day to spread this sort of message wider that men are important and men do go through uh, some really difficult stuff? I don't know. Maybe we need to pose that question to more men to, to, ask, <laughs> to ask what would... Yeah what would it draw your interest 
so what I notice is, so Movember, the, yeah. the, yes. the, the I think that was a great concept. Yeah. Um, I notice on Twitter it doesn't get much, it doesn't get much play. So I don't know beyond that mm -hmm. if if there's men really, if it is drawing attention. Um, I have to say that I see that about the various months that you know whatever the yeah are, of course it doesn't yes. draw a lot of attention. Um, yeah. But I did think that was a great idea is talking to guys. And and I have to say that um, there's there's been a lot of movement. So we have a lot of athletes that have come out and male athletes have come out and talked about mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think that has really helped break down the barriers. And um, mm -hmm. so maybe it, maybe it takes some more of that, more of some famous men who are yeah. talking about um making life emotionally better and psychologically yeah. better for males um and addressing this that it just is astounding to me this the stats on the deaths of despair yeah this. well sorry yeah. let you go well the well, 75 no. 75 percent of uh yeah the deaths it's really of, sad those deaths of despair categories being male yeah. mm -hmm. well you know i'm I I deal with the uh, I don't deal with I, I I coach men and women but mostly just men right now it just seems to be the what's happening within my life is, is I just have a lot of men willing to come forward and speak to me and they do say that speaking to a woman is easier than speaking to another man in whatever capacity it may be so what I've noticed when it comes to that permanent deletion of themselves. It's this slow burn that originally, okay, so it starts with the abuse at home in whatever fashion, whatever. And then you have the legal abuse, legal abuse that you explained very, very well in, mm -hmm. in your book. It's so laid out so perfectly. But then I, I think back and I think, well, the court system and the legal system, and from my own um, ignorant point of view, was created by men because it's mm. been around for so long, they would have never allowed a woman to enter that room. So they created this, this hub, this, these men created this thing, but down the track and down the line, it's destroying men's lives because the courts seemingly for whatever reason, always favor in the women. It's like, so it's this thing designed by men, but it's the thing that is slowly, slowly, is the demise of the men because you go to court mm -hmm. and you got your false allegations and then you can't see your kids and you got to pay horrendous amounts of money for whatever reason we can't figure out because she's making her own money you know just you could probably do away with that for some people but then they get the, like it's set up so the men get into such a financial bind mm -hmm. such a financial mm -hmm. bind you can go from no debt to a hundred thousand dollars in debt in a year just because you have a spouse that doesn't want to let you go because mm -hmm. like yeah they want to let you go but not until you're drained financially not until they get everything so mm -hmm. i just feel like they should probably go look at the very beginning of that of that cycle so it's the the abusive part and then but everything that like the abuse the compounding abuse on top of it like it makes perfect sense why they're doing it and i like you just need to follow the yellow brick road back down the line of okay well how did he get here it's like well this thing that we're not talking about that's yes. what the problem is yeah this so, little thing here that no one wants to address yeah yeah so recently i looked at how did how did the courts get to where they are now how did mm -hmm. the how did the dv system get to where it is now where it's so anti-male and so you know, got to the point where it was believe all women, that yeah. kind of stuff. And the courts are still very much skewed towards believe women. Um, so I did a blog post about it recently and it, and it largely goes back to the Duluth model. So the Duluth model has colored everything when it comes to the, the vast majority of the world's uh, approach to domestic violence. Um, and, and this was, so when we go back to government starting to care about, we have these people getting hurt in relationships and now we're suddenly going to start to care about them versus, well, that was just happening at home. So we'll, we'll ignore that. Yeah. So they started to care and they didn't know what to do about it. So 
it happened in Duluth. Uh, I think Duluth is in Minnesota, uh, in the U.S. And uh, that the police, et cetera, courts reached out to these women who were organizing around DV. And mm -hmm. they created this whole model of what is DV, what's happening, what should we do about it? From that little bit of experience, and that experience was entirely with women victims of DV, with male perpetrators of DV. And that is like 40, 50 years ago, and it has been entrenched. It has, mm -hmm. and then we moved into the Violence Against Women Act, which totally skewed funding in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and you weren't allowed to basically weren't you didn't get money to to look at it in a balanced way. You got money to uh, help with women who were victims. You had active squelching of statistics that show it's more balanced, and then you had perpetuation. Okay. So one of the ways it's perpetuated is they do research on who's in the shelters. Oh, it's mostly women in the shelters. Well, of course it's mostly women in the shelters because that's the only people you're allowing into the shelter. <laughs> it right. says women shelter <laughs> over the door. It's in the name. In. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they do research on the populations uh, that are in perpetrator programs. Well, who are in the perpetrator programs? It's men because that's the way the system is set up to yeah. only shuffle men there. Yeah. And so their stats then became the self-perpetuating. Oh, look, it's mostly yeah. men who are getting hurt. Oh, oh. look, it's almost all men that are doing it. But the difference is general population studies. And it's the general population studies. And there's hundreds of them that show this pretty even breakdown. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of women who are abusing and the number of men who are abusing. And then you have a, a percentage of relationships where both are. Right. Um, it, right. it may not go so far as what I'd want to label mutual, because to me, mutual has a connotation of equal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but certainly can be bi bi-directional. It's going in both directions, right. but right. It, might not be, it might not be equal. And you know, one might be reactionary. Yeah. But right. Yeah. I've got a blog post about the Duluth model. It just kind of makes me pull my it's, hair. Oh, well, I, you know, if I want to go. I do actually want to go to the forest and beat my drums now after <laughs> hearing about that because that's, that, that's just crazy to me that, that that's what they would do. So it's almost like it's almost like me saying um, this is what I think about it and this is this is how I really view all of this and this is what we should do about it. And then going ahead you know, 20 years or 10 years or five years and referencing myself as the source of truth. It's like, well, yeah. yes, well, this is all, we're going to base all these laws based on what I said or based on, you know, they would say this study, but it's really just what I said. It's yeah. not, it's not anything based in any kind of balanced uh, research, like you said. So, yeah. oh, well, you, I mean, it's frustrating to hear, but thank you for sharing that because that is, that is really shocking to hear that it was just literally created by a group of women uh, and never re-looked at, essentially, in the court sense, never really re-looked at without using that as the base for all the changes that came after that. Yeah. But don't don't they realize, and I say they as like the collective um, courts, everyone that's included. So you have your child, so you have your child's support people, you've got the courts, you've got it, you know, all the different things that are involved. So if a man is tapped out, so say he's at $100,000 in debt and his wife wants $4,000 a month for the kid uh, child support, well, he he's also needs to pay his rent or his mortgage, whatever it may be. He needs a car to get to work, to you feed himself, all of these things. So next thing you know, he gets behind and now he's in debt. And now, you know, like he's kicking out more than he's bringing in all because she wants all this money like she wants to drag it through the the legal system mm -hmm. and then so say he can't pay his child support because she's tapped him out like she's she's gone in with the actual 
malice of saying, I'm going to go in and I'm going to make sure he is not attractive to anybody now because mm. he's not going to have any money. I'm going to have all the money. So now he can't pay his child support. So the second after that, that minute tick of my child support was supposed to be there, she's on the phone saying, well, he's not paying his child support. Then he goes to jail. Well, now he really can't get a job because he's been to jail because you couldn't be patient for 50 seconds. Like the whole thing is just, and now you've got an extra big problem because now he's in jail. He's the, the children or child or child doesn't have a father. Like you thought you were removed before. Well, now you're really removed. Like that could, that one decision to destroy another person financially has such massive repercussions for generations, for generations, mm -hmm. because that kid's damaged. And if that kid doesn't get any help, well, it's just gonna, it it's going. generational. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so sad. So well, sad. And you, you raise a good point. It, and that is if, if people can't have em empathy for the man, yeah. can they have empathy for the children who are being right. harmed right. by, right. by the perpetuation of this thing being so skewed? Mm -hmm. we, and, need to bring, we need to bring balance into the system. When and yeah, absolutely. And and Les, when you were just running through that, the the thing that kept going through my mind was, yeah, at that step, yep, yeah, nobody cares. At that step, nobody cares. At that step, nobody cares. He's in jail, nobody cares. He, you know, he gets to maybe part of that seventy five percent suicide. Nobody cares. Yep. Like, yep. there's just nobody cares all along the way, um, which is really really sad. And I think for me, just you know, having a little think about what you said earlier as well, I mean, both of you, but about how maybe we can we can get the word out more or we can give this a bigger voice, this topic. Um, I think what we're, you know, on a bigger scale, but what we're doing right now, I think, you know, having two really, you know, intelligent women talking about this topic um, and, and raising this issue and supporting men is fantastic. And I think the way I see it is, we, there was a women's movement a long time ago and it's, you know, it's, it's ongoing, but there's been a women's movement. There's also been, uh, you know, men's rights activists, MRAs and, you know, men on, I would say not all, but uh, some extreme guys on that side as well. Mm -hmm. My, where I really see that, that this being able to be shared out and become, you know, people to become more aware is a joint effort from both men and women to help everybody let's help all victims here like mm -hmm. there's a lot of support systems for women which is great i think that's absolutely fantastic because there should be mm -hmm. but let's get together let's work together let's do it together as men and women who are just human beings we're just people so let's let's do it together and 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 share this message as uh, you know one of unification instead of um it's it's women and it's men and it's you know mm -hmm. sure this is what we're talking about but we're not the abusers in this situation. We're the ones who we, we want to try to support the victims on both sides. So yeah. we should be able to do that together. Yeah. And I, and I have seen that that is something that's come out of the Johnny Depp trial. So mm -hmm. I, I noticed that there, it has opened the eyes of female victims of, mm -hmm. of, of DV and, and they have, they are speaking, it opened their eyes and they're speaking out. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they are. I, I think they're a key to change because the DV community itself is is a closed system. Yes, mm -hmm. that is you know self perpetuating and and does not does not welcome people like me who uh, want right. to say something different. But if these women who have the experience, who are part of the DV community, mm -hmm. they start to talk about it and they have started. So they talk about it more and more. That's the ripple effect, I think, where we'll see, we see change. I don't think we can expect some of the people at the, that are the most powerful in the movement to make change. Mm -hmm. Unless they get enlightened by the exposure of just a, a groundswell. Right. Yeah, it rises up when it when it comes to that. Like they'll get the message eventually. Now, when it comes to Depp, did you like? I think because we all know Amber didn't want it televised, and we know why now. Mm -hmm. We know why mm -hmm. because uh, we got to see what it was like in the UK. 
So because the UK wasn't televised, I feel it went under the radar by leaps and bounds under under the radar. Mm -hmm. Like not a lot of people actually know. And if they do know, um, like unless you're in, you know, if you're not actually in the community, like within Twitter or on YouTube or on Instagram, mm -hmm. whatever, like you may not know that that case was against the sun. It wasn't about Amber, like it was, but she was just like the outside thing mm -hmm. that happened. So the fact that it was televised, I think, made such a difference, such a massive difference, because you could see him, you mm -hmm. could see his emotional reactions to things, mm -hmm. you could see her and her behavior, and your, you, you know, the audios, the audios alone. I don't know what she was thinking when she released the one um, leaked it, the one she said, go, go tell them, Johnny, tell them I, Johnny Depp, am a victim. Cause we're all like, hold on. That's what I heard. Right. Hold mm -hmm. on. She called herself out right then and there. And she did not mm -hmm. expect that to happen. I don't think, I don't think she saw the shift, like the, the tidal wave coming her way, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just so proud of him cause he's so private. And honestly, I, I, I don't want to say I don't care about celebrity, but I don't care of what they do in their life. Like I don't care what they do mm -hmm. for a job. So for me to be covering such a high profile thing, really, I shake my head at sometimes thinking, if you told me this, I was doing, I was doing this <laughs> five years ago, I would have told you, uh -uh, there's absolutely no way I have no interest in that. But it really did. It, um, it opened up a lot of eyes and mm -hmm. I was able still to learn so much, not only about my own past, but how can I help? people mm -hmm. moving forward because I had mm -hmm. a lot of aha moments every time there was a win for Johnny it was a win that I did not get mm -hmm. oh. I took it very personally very very personally and I think that's why I was so emotionally invested I cried when he lost in the UK and I cried when he won in VA I cried both times because yeah. it was mm -hmm. it was a loss for not only him but it was a loss for me and all the other victims as well and when it was a win it was a win for everybody as well I was so heavily involved and like emotionally invested. I never thought I'd get like that <laughs> over a man I never met. I was just but, so proud of him. Yeah. Well, but it's fantastic though. You did such a good job covering it. And I think it, that's the exact, like what you just said, probably in that last two minutes is the sentiment that so many other people, uh, women who've gone through something similar to you have felt. And that sentiment has come through much, much more since the televised trial. Because uh, a, a lot more women have gone, oh, my gosh, that's, that's exactly what I went through. That's exactly what I heard. That's, that is how my abuser spoke to me. You know, that's, that, that's what I heard. Um, and as much as Amber thinks she's a good actress, she just isn't. So she couldn't <laughs> even get on the stand and act as though she was yeah. a reasonable human being. She can't even act that way. So yeah, I think, yeah, it was huge. Yeah, yeah, and abuse, yeah. people who have been the victim of, of abuse recognized her acting even more, you know, mm -hmm. recognize this is not genuine. This is, yeah. this is a caricature of yeah. what she imagines she's supposed to be, yes. it looks like as, yeah. as a victim. So that exposed her more as well. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's very. Uh, I love hearing, Les, that you you as a woman, it wasn't your womanness that was the thing that was connecting. It was the commonality of somebody else who experienced abuse, and that's yeah. exactly what you were saying, Stevie. We have the movement forward involves people coming together and caring about abuse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is what that diverged fifty years ago. Mm -hmm. Where instead of it being, okay, domestic violence, we should care about this happening in homes. What can we do about it? And, and it got skewed right away to it being, oh, we need to care about women. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to help these women. Not we have to look at abuse and help people who are the targets of abuse. And even that we have to help the people who are being abusive not be abusive anymore. So we can have happy yeah. households. Instead yeah. it was... How can we how can we make these bad men stop being bad? How can we help these poor women? Yeah. Yes. And that's how it got messed up. And, and you know, in, in your book, you did it in such a gentle way hmm. where you didn't point the finger and say, you know, when you were talking about how to recognize it within yourself, like, are you abusive? 
are 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 some of the things that you're doing possibly an issue just the the you were so gentle with it instead of saying hey you're you're an explicit of explicit of and you know we we really don't like your kind around here it was just <laughs> just just have just have a little look inside because yeah. when i read that i was like okay i i got into it i was like do i do any of these things and i really mm -hmm. took a deep dive look into you know the questions that you asked and then i think the most natural question that you asked and i thought well if only it could have been summed up like this forever ago if you yeah. are if you look at your own behavior and you see it you wouldn't want it done to you like if you see if you if it was done to you would you call it abusive mm -hmm. then don't do it then don't do it yeah. it was just so simple so simple but unfortunately <laughs> i've tried that i tried that in the past i i tried to give as much as i got and it did not work mm. well in my my favor. Yeah, like I got worse. <laughs> I got I got worse. Right. Right. Yeah, because I was like, mm. okay, well, this is how we do things around here, and it clearly was not. It was not. Mm -hmm. So I just love that that you you know just have people asking because we don't ask ourselves enough questions. I feel mm -hmm. right. Like we, we, I, I just we're very we don't look in. We we don't. I I feel like there's there's an immediate blame to anything external mm, it's yeah and it's like and it, you mentioned it in the book too and in, in the sense of abuse where uh, a woman might say well i behaved like this because you did x y or right. z and we do do that in general in life i feel like as as human beings we tend to not want to look internally we'd rather say well it was you know like the you know the, the sky was blue so i couldn't do uh you know i couldn't do whatever it was i couldn't um i couldn't meet you for it. lunch because the sky was, yeah, the sky was <laughs> <laughs> exactly. i had an well, affair because the grass was green <laughs> right i had to lay down on it so. yeah. <laughs> and not with you <laughs> whoopsies yeah well uh, look i think um we you know we've we've covered some really great uh you know topics points of discussion here international men's day Anne's amazing book, absolutely brilliant. You know, Les has mentioned how good it is. I have. There it is. It is just fantastic. We'll put the link in the description. Please go on uh, and buy it. Give it a read. Um, but before we finish up, um, Anne, I wanted to give you the opportunity to um, to just you know share anything else that you wanted to share, or maybe finish on a, a you know an important point for you. Um, well, just maybe maybe finishing with pos positivity. I, I do think that uh, I've witnessed a shift happen culturally. So I used to get more backlash than I get now. You know, so myself mm -hmm. as an advocate for abused men, I would get more more often get backlash, more severe backlash mm -hmm. um, than I than I feel like I get now. I still get some, mm -hmm. um, but not as much and so i'm i'm seeing that as as progress and i'm also there's there's way more people talking about this mm -hmm. than there was mm -hmm. so i i wrote the book a number of years ago and and there were a few years in there where i kind of just barely did much to try and continue to keep it going because i just felt like there's just no it, it's not time yet right. and now i feel right. like it's there are there's yes much more willingness. So I want to end in that in that encouragement. And for men who are abused, this has been crucial. This I, I want to encourage you that there are people who can hear your voices and mm -hmm. you're not alone. There's a lot of other men who are experiencing and have experienced similar things. And yep. you may not yet have found somebody who can hear you. And hopefully you can, you know, keep, keep up the keep up the hope that someone can hear you and assist you absolutely well, well said and and i'm so glad to hear that you're not getting um as much backlash uh, <laughs> yeah. as before yeah. hopefully hopefully all of that dissipates even more over the coming you know the next coming few years that would be good mm -hmm. i'd love to hear that well, um yeah. les was there anything else you wanted to mention or or say before we finish up as well if I do, it will take us on another hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then I will just finish by saying thank you. Thank you, Anne. And, of course, always thank you, Les, as well. But thank you, Anne, so much for joining us. It's just been such an interesting conversation, and I feel like we probably could talk for a very, very long time about uh, all of these issues and, 
and you know even ways that we can uh, we can help and ways we can get this conversation moving and spread further around the world. But uh, thank you very much. It's been so so lovely to have you. And uh, to everyone who's listening or watching, we'll see you all next time. I have something. I I have something. I have something. Okay. I just want to I just want to put it out there because I told Anne before we started that because I have like my bookshelf is full of you know uh, books on abuse and stuff like that. And I read them all. And this one, by far, is the most um, easy to read. It's not only easy to read, but you you take it in and it's like the, I just have to say it is the best book I have read on the subject because it is specifically for men. It is so fantastic. You There's no fluff. There's no nothing. It's gentle. I loved it. So I just want to put that out there that that's my endorsement to it. <laughs> and I don't care what anyone says. That's my endorsement. <laughs> well, it's a great endorsement. So thank it's a you, great Anne. endorsement. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. And thank you. Thank you for doing this with us. It's just been such a pleasure. Oh, You're such a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me as well. Thank you. Thank you for being you. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs>